Hi, my name is Farah Alabe, and I'm a systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, JPL is a NASA center out here in Pasadena, California, and we specialize in robotic exploration of the solar system. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sabrina Khan. I'm a senior at MIT studying aerospace engineering and planetary science, and I'm here today with JPL systems engineer Farah Alibay for our first installment of Sit Down Sundays for WOA. Uh, so welcome, Farah. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with um, a question that I feel like most engineers in aerospace get asked at some point, which is why space? Um, so can you kind of explain what led you to pick your major in aerospace engineering and why you ended up working in space sector? Yeah, and for me, it was kind of a, a roundabout journey. So growing up, I always liked space. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, and so like, you know, it was all about Star Wars and Star Trek and Apollo 13, and we were still flying the shuttle missions. And, and so it was always, you know, it started from those movies and those dreams. Um, and then eventually, I sort of realized that, like, hold on, like, maybe I could be an astronaut, or maybe I could work in this field. And I was always super attracted, in, especially in movies like Apollo 13, when you saw, like, all the engineers work together to literally like fit a square peg in a round hole type thing. Right. And um, so that it was always kind of a dream. And then I think it really clicked like in when I was like 16 or 17, like trying to decide what kind of career I was going to have. And I remember taking one of those tests, those online tests of like career tests. And it came up as like number one that I should be an aerospace engineer. I'm like, not even kidding. And I was like, wait, Yes, like what? Of course I should do this. Um, so I, I uh, went to school at Cambridge in England. And unfortunately in England, there wasn't really much of a space program. So my undergraduate masters are more on the aero side of aerospace. I worked on jet engines, and, uh, which is still super cool. Um, but I sort of had like an itch that, oh, I, I really kind of want to try to work in aerospace. Like, I really want to work at NASA. Like I want to be like one of those people in the movies, but like more modern. Um, so I ended up applying for graduate school and I got an offer to do graduate school at MIT. And I kind of just took the leap. I was like, you know what? I'm still young. I'm just going to go do this. Worst case, I'll come back to England and I'll have, you know, I'll still have my old degrees to rely on and I, sh I should be fine. Right. Um, so I ended up at MIT um, and decided to sort of, pursue the space systems, aerospace route. And while I was there, I took, uh, you know, I went to a bunch of conferences, but I also went to as many workshops as I could, which like, if anyone is in graduate school right now and wondering like, oh, how can I, you know, how can I make the best of this time? And how can I get to know my industry if I'm not quite ready to publish yet? There are a ton of workshops out there for students. I did the Caltech Space Challenge, there's the Planetary Science Summer School that's held at JPL. Um, there's something called Rascal, which is held in Florida every year. I did all of those, and uh, they were all super fun. Um, and like usually, they fly you out to cool places. Um, but I, that's how I met the person that eventually became my mentor at JPL, and that opened the door for me because I was able to get internships here at JPL. And personally, my first internship at JPL was. The summer of 2012, which for any space buffs out there, that's the summer that we landed Curiosity on Mars. So I was at JPL when we landed Curiosity on Mars. And, and like, it was just incredible, right? To see these like kick-ass engineer land this like car-sized rover on Mars. And from like my little bright-eyed intern, and I thought, wow, these are people that I could work with and that are pushing really the boundaries of what we do in technology. It's not just space, it's technology as a whole. So uh, I was pretty much sold at that point. And that's how I ended up choosing GPL specifically as the place I wanted to work at because, because of my interest in robotic exploration and like just the cool things that they do. Yeah. And, and JPL is really interesting too, because it's like not quite a commercial space company and it's not quite government. It's not fully government. So yeah. that, you know, what, what makes it really unique in that sense that like working at JPL is really cool in that way? It's funny because I was just talking about that with a coworker earlier. So JPL is a FFR DC. It's a federally funded research and development center. And that means that, um, so we are a yeah. NASA center, but I am not a government employee. I'm a Caltech employee. So it's a government lab that's managed by a university. But what that allows us to do is it allows us to take more risk. 
uh, it allows us to be bold and new and push the boundaries because we're not quite constrained the same way as other centers are. And FFRDCs historically, that's what they are used for. If you look at the FFRDCs across the country, they're the place that really foster technology innovation and risk taking because they don't they they serve a different purpose with within the broader government agency. So I think that's one of the reasons why JPL is able, for example, to do technology demonstration missions. Right? I worked on the Marco CubeSat as part of uh, my career. So I worked on it for two years. And, and Marco is a pair of CubeSats that co-launched with the InSight Lander. And when InSight landed on Mars back in 2018, we used those CubeSats to do telecommunication relay uh, back to Earth during the entry and descent and landing sequence. And these were the first interplanetary CubeSats. I mean, it was a kind of a, a rogue team of engineers that put them together, right? It was a small team. But that's the advantage of being an FFRDC is that we have our own kind of funding to do crazy things like that. It was the same story with Pathfinder. It's the same story about the Mars helicopter now. Um, so it's kind of the, the advantage of being in that situation. And so you are also, so you're a systems engineer at JPL. And as an undergrad in aerospace engineering, I find systems engineering to be one of the more nebulous concepts in engineering. So can you kind of describe what it's like um, to do the work that you do? Yeah, I always call like systems engineers as jacks of all trades because it's not really clear. Even if you ask me now to describe like, what's a systems engineer? What did you study, right? And uh, for those of you studying aerospace, one of the things that you'll notice in your education is that you're getting kind of a broad education. You're getting a little bit of mechie, a little bit of aero, a little bit of EE. It's all of that, right? And and really, that's what systems engineering is, is that um, on a given day, I can interact with specialists in different subsystems and understand what they're doing enough to have a smart conversation, but I certainly can't do their work, right? But my job is at the system level and whatever we're calling the system, it could be a whole project, it could be a flight system, it could be a subsystem. But my job is to make sure that I understand the interactions, because often you'll find in spacecraft and any complex systems really, is that you're fighting with resources and you're having to deal with like complex things having to talk to each other. And so I always think of the systems engineer as the person that sits in between and makes sure that everything fits and everything can talk to each other. Um, now, in terms of what my job has looked like, it has changed a ton over the past six years. I feel like every time I finish a project, I change jobs and I'm still a systems engineer, but I do something slightly different. Um, so for example, when I worked on Marco on those CubeSats, I was a project systems engineer. So I, I worked across like not just looking at the CubeSats themselves and looking at the subsystems, but also how they were going to interact with the ground system and things like that. Then I moved to Insight and became a payload systems engineer. And so the instruments were being built in different places. And I was the interface between the instruments now on Mars 2020, I'm a flight system systems engineer, but focusing on the surface attitude and pointing system. Um, so again, I have to make sure that that surface system um, knows how to work by itself. So it knows, okay, I know where I'm pointed. I know how far I've gone and things like that. But I also need to understand within the broader scope of how we operate a rover, um, whether that system is able to appropriately talk to other systems. You've been fortunate enough to be involved in, I think at this point, officially four missions, which would be Marco A and Marco B, InSight, and Mars 2020. Which yeah. Is and you've seen all of them launch, which is really cool. Um, so my question to you is, which one, which one was the most memorable? And if it wasn't one of those missions in particular launching, what, what else could it have been? Yeah, it's hard, right? It's like asking asking someone to choose which child they prefer. Um, <laughs> I think honestly, the most my most memorable day at JPL so far is actually the day that we landed Insight, um, and it's because I, I remember you know I was with all my friends and we were in the operations room, and I remember it, to me it was like you know Mar I worked on Marco for two years, I worked on Insight for two years by the end, two and a half years by the end, um, and so it had been like by on landing day, I realized that like both of those spacecraft together were like most of my career at that point. I'd been at JPL about five years and I was like, 
this is my, I remember when it launched and I was like, this is my whole career on this rocket. But what I vividly remember from the InSight landing was two things. So one is, um, is the moment where, uh, where they called that they had signal lock from Marco. Um, and I, I was the only person excited in the room because I was with my InSight team. But like, I think for me, I was like, oh, it worked. Like everything that we, it's really strange, right? To think like, we build this CubeSat, like I've definitely like, there's definitely some blood, sweat and tears on that thing. That's mine. And like, and we, you know, it was this weird thing where like we came up with the idea together and built it. And then I was like, it did what we said it would do. Like you think, you mean physics works? Like what? <laughs> um, so that was a really cool moment. And then when I, not when I heard the words touchdown, but when we got that first picture from Mars and to me, it's really strange because when you launch a spacecraft, you know, you know, you're on your way somewhere. So there's not really many images. It's just conceptual, but it's, it's such an incredible feeling. So, so right now that's the most memorable. We'll have to see. I mean, when perseverance lands, I'll probably feel the way in the same way. Um, but I think that landing day is, is quite special. Okay. So my next question is kind of exciting for me because I don't know if you remember this, but I kind of cold emailed you in like my sophomore year and asked you for advice on the internship that I was applying to. And then more recently, like you've re been really helpful. Like you've totally responded to me that one time. And then since then you've been like super integral and in, like helping me get a lot of the internships that I do have, which is like, I'm so grateful to you for those things. Oh, that's awesome. So one of my questions for you is, um, how has mentorship played a role in your own success and how have you done other things to reach back um, and mentor others? Yeah. So for me, Ray, I think I sort of mentioned it, but there, there were a few like seminal people in my career that, that said yes, that opened doors for me that are the reason why I'm at JPL today and I was able to like live my dream. And I think for me, it's like, it's so awesome to be able to do what I love every day that, you know, I just wish that everyone could do the, the job that they, that they love. And so, so whenever I can, I try and give back. And it's, it's, I always feel like I don't do enough because it is kind of a busy job also, but I do try. And so I think it's really important to give back because that's how I got my opportunities. And, and also, I mean, selfishly, I want the best and most diverse team possible to work with, right? Because how the hell are we going to get these great missions out there? We need the best engineers. And, and to me, what's really important also is, is we need a workplace where everyone can be themselves and everyone can see themselves and their coworkers. And, um, and it's also been proven, right, that diverse teams do better because we, um, because you, through your different life experiences, you have a different way to address the same problems. And so the more uh, creativity you have, the better it is. So that's why I do it. And I think in terms of what it gets me, it mostly brings me joy and great people to work with, um, which I think is, is kind of, the goal of all of this, in addition to doing cool missions, I wouldn't do this if I didn't enjoy my job and enjoy the people I work with. So, yeah. yeah. And I think you mentioned to me once when we were talking that one of your role models growing up was the astronaut Julie Payette. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and because she was one of the only female astronauts at the time, right? Do you think that since then, since she's since you've flown, you've done undergrad, you've done grad school, you've gone to JPL. Do you think that the number of females and women of color and just people of color um, in the aerospace industry has increased? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely increased, right? Like we can see that in our astronaut selections. We can see that even like, even in the past six years that I've been at JPL, I can see the difference, that, um, especially in our younger engineers. But I do also think that we have a long way to go, right? So I think aerospace in general is still less than 30% women. We're still underrepresented and people of color is still also less than 30%. And if you think about it, LA is like, more than 50% Hispanic, right? Why do we not have representation of our own community? And so that's actually one of the things that I really care about. Um, and I'm actually part of the in inclusion advisory committee at JPL that's advising the lab and the director on, on how we can improve that. Um, so yes, there's been improvement, but there's a long way to go. Um, I think in the field of outreach and communication, though, one thing that's really changed a lot, and I'm hoping that we continue to leverage is that we have this whole revival of like 
science communicators that, that have direct access and that can show, show the public what's happening and educate. And I think that's a huge advantage that we have today. So I'm really hoping that this movement to educate the public and use the platforms that we have are going to help us, um, help us show people that they belong here too. I think you don't even allow yourself to dream about these positions if you don't see people that look like you. Um, and so we're definitely, all I have to say, we're definitely seeing a change. I'm seeing it a lot in the younger population that's joining. We could definitely do better and we definitely need to do better in the middle to upper management area um, because there are still, you know, on projects, hardly anyone up the management change that looks like me um, or that looks different than your stereotypical engineer. And I think we need to change that in order to show people that like, yes, you can progress in your career and yes, there's going to be diversity in hiring and promotion. And so my last question is what advice would you give to young women and any other students interested in your career? So yeah, I think my biggest piece of advice is to not let anyone tell you no, uh, whatever it is that, whatever dream it is that you want to follow and whatever career it is that you want to follow, there will be naysayers along the way. So many of them. Uh, for me, it started like when I was 16, actually after I did that test that I mentioned and, and it said aerospace engineer to go sit with a career advisor and I showed her the test. And I was like, I guess that's what I'm going to do. And uh, number two was like doctor or something. Right. And, um, and, and I remember distinctly, we remember her saying, well, you know, that's a male dominated field. Are you sure you want to do this? Like, I don't know if you'll be as successful. Like, how are you going to integrate there? And I was like, what? <laughs> um, and obviously, me being me, I was like, I'll show you. But, you know, and, and even then, like, I started school and I, when I went to Cambridge, you know, there was all of these kids from private school that were like, that had knew way more than I did. I was like so far behind just because I'd gone to public school and like, you know, that's, that was, and, and along the way, I thought, am, am I going to succeed? So there was a lot of self-doubt and a lot of other people instilling doubt on me. Um, but I think what worked for me is that I sort of kept my eyes on the prize. So I think that's my biggest piece of advice is put yourself out there, take risks because you can, um, and don't let people tell you no and look for opportunities and look for those people who are going to answer those emails, who are going to have that chat with you at a workshop and offer you an internship and, and be forward about what you want, right? Like people are not going to, give you opportunities if you don't tell them what it is you want. And I think as women and as people of color, that's often very difficult to do. Um, and, but know that that space is growing for you and it's, it's there for you to take. Uh, it just takes a little bit of, uh, you know, of initiative and a little bit of getting outside of that comfort zone to go after what you want and really communicate that and, and look for those allies that are going to open those doors for you. Well, thank you so much for being our first interviewee for Sit Down Sundays. Um, it was amazing hearing from you. Absolutely good luck in continuing with remote working at JPL. Um, thank you. It was well for you. Thanks for watching Sit Down Sundays. This is Woa's new interview series dedicated to bringing you the experiences and perspectives of professionals in the aerospace industry. If you like what you saw, definitely go check out our channel. We'll be posting educational videos, workshops and tutorials, and more interviews like this one. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, and let us know what you think in the comments. See you next time.